The strangest song of all to appear on the band list is In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins. Now that I do know. <laughs> Legend. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Glaze. As always, hello there, I'm your host Simon Wimes here. Danny writes to me a script. Radio Gargard, music that was banned for baffling reasons. This sounds like a Danny suggestion, I hope it's good. It's not something I would have picked. But, uh, yeah, strong, strong start there to the episode, Simon. Sell it! Yes! Let's go! Coffee. Mmm. Very, very hot coffee. It's a good job we have clever people out there to decide exactly what kind of catchy pop songs are far too subversive for our sensitive little ears. Perhaps it's just a bit strange that these potentially career-sinking decisions are usually made by a small group of stuffy old radio executives who still believe that Barry Manilow could tone down some of his saucier material. Uh, another problem with this is Barry, Man Barry Manilow. I mean, I definitely know the name. I don't know what he's... He's got a very deep voice, right? But that's all I know about him. I'm sure he does some, like let's get it all sort of <laughs> deep like love making songs right but that's all i know about him <laughs> oh, and this uh, this episode is going to expose not that there's anything more to expose i've been completely exposed my uh, absolute lack of knowledge regarding anything pc and by pc i mean pop culture and it could be argued that any form of censorship of the arts is just an example of self-righteous dickheads in powerful positions shielding the masses from creativity, truth, ideals, and freedom of speech and expression. I mean, I do think that, like, often... Like, there's a reason movies get ratings. I think that's generally good. I don't think my kids should be in the car. Like, I don't know. I'll listen to some fairly explicit music. And I don't really want my, my kids to be exposed to that on the radio or in movies or by me. And like, now there's a point, like my kid's definitely old enough, she'll start repeat, she's repeating stuff. So it's like, okay, I can no longer listen to, to like, you know, some rap and shit. <laughs> when you're like, around her. <laughs> uh, it's not okay. I'm gonna kick his ass. <laughs> That's not nice. Maybe the sense have sometimes got a point. Imagine if Timothy and Gemma are eating their bowls of ready break at the breakfast table. This is exactly my argument. We need these people sometimes. Uh, before setting off to school, a mum cheerfully turns on the kitchen radio. The last thing mum wants to hear blaring out of the speakers is too drunk to fuck by the dead Kennedys. <laughs> so, it's perfectly understandable how respectable broadcasters might feel the need to put a muffle on controversial tracks that could contain strong language, hate speech, overtly sexual overtones, or just the voice of Justin Bieber. Fuck yeah, Danny. Hell yeah! Um, we need to, we need to, we need to do something about Justin. His music is so bad. We've brought this up before. It's so bad. I'd play you some right now if I knew I, I wouldn't get copyright struck and the music would go to Justin Bieber because I really feel it just is awful. It's just bad music. But there are other examples when you begin to wonder if the minds of the censors have become tragically warped from absorbing all of this relentless filth and depravity. Puff the Magic Dragon. This is the one that's like, Puff the Magic Dragon lived by the... God, Simon, you are so bang on that you're going to get claimed by Puff Daddy, whoever the fuck owns this song. Um, I know it's not Puff Daddy, it's really old. Uh, but this one was about... It's not about smoking weed, is it? Everyone's like, Puff the Magic Dragon. What the fuck do you think that Magic Dragon is? You puff on the Magic Dragon, bitch. Yes! Oh. Oh, it could also mean, like, something else. More sexual, I guess. I just put that together, it didn't even enter my mind before. But I thought it was about smoking drugs, and then I found out it wasn't about smoking drugs, and it's just a pleasant children's song. Oh my god, stop rambling, get on with it, Simon. Oh, this song is heart-crushingly sad. If you don't feel moved by the aching melancholia dripping from the tear-jerking climax of Puff the Magic Dragon, then you've lost all the fire from your soul. Wait, oh, wait, what? All I know about this song is it goes, Puff the magic dragon lived by the sea and hollered in the hotter mists by the lands of Hollily. Is that how it goes? Is that the lyrics? I did, that's all I know. Oh my goodness. Nice pipes, Tamika. Released by American folk band Peter, Paul, and Mary in 1963, the jaunty track sounds quite uplifting until the final verse. It tells of a boy called Jackie Paper who befriends a magical dragon in a land called Honolulu. Yes! 
and embarks upon a series of frolicking adventures by the sea. Yet although Jackie and Puff sounds like inseparable buddies, Jackie grows up in the final verse and no longer goes out to visit his flying friend. Poor old Puff retreats back to his lonely cave in sorrow and presumably slides into a full-scale depression. So, so the end of Puff the Magic Dragon is Puff ends up basically wallowing depression, probably leading to suicide or at least early death from alcoholism because of loneliness. It is sad, Danny. I can feel the melancholia right now in my dead soul. It might sound like a harmless sing-along tune, but Puff was banned in Singapore and Hong Kong. Later, there were even calls for a radio ban in the US in 1970, by which time Vice President Spyro Agnew reckons that... <laughs> Spyro Agnew... <laughs> What sort of name is Agnew is like the worst sounding surname and Spyro? What is he some sort of 1990s dragon? Shit. It's a sad sight, Sparks. Maybe he was maybe he wanted it banned because he was tired of being associated with dragons and he, he didn't want any more dragons. Spyro the dragon, anyone else play that shit? Spyro had to <laughs> What sort of name is Spyro? <laughs> It's gonna turns out I get cancelled because he comes from like he's gonna be like yeah no it's it's a very traditional name of the X Y Z people and you're being very offensive, and I'm just like okay okay and if that's true I take it back if he's just a regular ass American dude I don't take it back it's a weird name Spyro had to. <laughs> war on the drug culture of music and movies. He also sounds like a dick, so I'm kind of okay to make fun of him. And he had called for a ban on the songs that were brainwashing the youth of America with pro-drug propaganda. Spyro, what's wrong with drugs, though? What's the matter with drugs? This included Puff the Magic Dragon. Spyro didn't get very far. I like how he's an important politician and Jan Danny's just gone with Spyro, his first name. A few years later, he resigns after being charged with extortion, bribery, and conspiracy. I blame Led Zeppelin. Spyro, Spyro, Spyro. Don't be extorting people. By the 1970s, it was apparently common knowledge that Puff was all about drugs rather than a boy and his magical dragon. Chasing the dragon was Chinese slang for smoking and inhaling the vapors of heroin. <laughs> Holy shit. I didn't realize that was what chasing- I thought chasing the dragon was like... Well, I know it's not smoking weed, but I thought it was like something not as intense as like inhaling the vapors of heroin. Which I honestly didn't even know you could do. <laughs> Well, too bad it wasn't meth. It just could have had you come down and sniff it out, huh, Kathy? Eat shit, Randall. I'm in recovery. And so Puff the Magic Dragon could perhaps be viewed as more of an instruction rather than a descriptive title. However, it seems that most people believe that the song was more specifically about weed. I thought so. In 1964, Newsweek article was the first to harvest some of the more compelling clues. Aside from all that puffing, the song includes references to an autumn mist which could be code for marijuana smoke, whilst the fictional land of Honolulu could be based on the real Hawaiian town of Hanali, which is famous for its cannabis growth. These are some coincidences, aren't there? But even if they are... It's just coincidence. That's what you'd say, at least. You'd be like, that's got nothing to do with Puff and the Magic. I mean, smoke. I mean, game in trouble, aren't I? It's about drugs. I'm sorry. There is no such thing as a coincidence. The fact that you're watching this video means you're energetically aligned with me and this message. By the sea was perceived to mean by the sea, as in sea for cannabis. All right, guys. Even Jackie Paper was believed to have been named after the rolling papers you need before you go flying with Puff. I mean, I get it. I get how people got here. It seems really legit that it could be about drugs. And if it is, that's fine with me. I even prefer it that way. It's a much better story of being about drugs rather than it being literally about a boy who goes to play with a f***ing magic dragon. That's some boring ass shit, whereas weed is awesome. Allegedly. I'll admit I felt all this was common knowledge. I thought Peter, Paul, and Mary were naughty folk hippies enjoying a little smoke and a little giggle. But it turns out I was wrong. Before he hooked up with Paul and Mary, Peter Yarrow wrote the song in 1958 based on an original poem by his roommate Lenny Lipton. And the song is essentially about growing up and the loss of childhood instance, the folk trio were clean living musicians and both Peter and Lenny claimed that they never even heard of Pot or Hanal Lee when they put together the poem and song in 1958. As Lenny reveals, oh, we're talking about Cornell in 1958. People were going to Hootenannies. They weren't smoking joints. Yeah, I guess this is it. Like, weed back in the day, it just wasn't, like, popular like it is today. It's like so, it's like legal in tons of places in America now, which is crazy. Europe, what's up? We're always, I thought we were ahead of the game on this kind of liberal shit. And now it's like you can go to America and they're just like selling weed in like shops and shit. 
uh, the Netherlands have done it. I think Portugal's decriminalized it. The rest of Europe's like, oh, no, 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 you can't have that. Why not? <laughs> yeah, that's weed. But I have to admit that I'm glad I looked into the real story of Puff, and not just because I've stumbled upon the innocent truth. After years of feeling traumatized by that sad ending, I've learned that Lenny Lipton actually wrote an additional verse of the poem, which never made it into the song in this missing final verse, which has been lost to the autumn mists of time. Puff later finds a new child friend to play with. Let's, uh, let's hope this new friend stuck around for a bit longer, not like that sniveling, dirty fly-by-night Jackie Paper. Seriously. That kid upset me. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, Danny. Strange fruit. If you're planning on hitting the town and you feel like putting on a warm-up tune to get in the mood, then I can't say I'd recommend the 1939 recording of Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. <laughs> I've heard a few like warm-up tunes like through school and university. My favorite one that we'd always listen to was the final countdown. It'd be like, we'd, we'd usually go around my mate's house before I'd go out and, you know, get a bit get faced and we'd always put on the final countdown is it by europa and it would be like on youtube back in the day and we'd put it up on his tv and everyone would dance around being like it's the final countdown <laughs> it reminds you of good times another one at other points was uh i'm just sharing my musical preferences here and these aren't even really preferences they're just going out songs i don't remember asking you a goddamn thing um, Just a Day by Feeder. Mwah, classic. Bow, bow, da, bow, 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 da, bow. <laughs> Great banging tunes. I love it. I'm going to go listen to these songs later and then not go out because I'm a middle-aged man with kids. Originally conceived as a poem by Abel Maripol a couple of years earlier, it was inspired by the horrifically racially motivated lynchings of the 19th and early 20th century in which African Americans were brutally murdered, most commonly by white Southerners on the flimsiest of unproven allegations. The past, everybody. In particular, the poem was inspired by a photograph of a 1930 double lynching in Indiana in which two black men were hung from trees in front of a mob of 5,000 people. Yeah, this, this, is, this is not the sort of thing that would inspire the final countdown, is it? They'd be like, oh my god, look at that lynching. <laughs> I'm not even sure that that joke's not really, I don't know. It's with, uh, it doesn't have any bad intent. That's no good. Widely regarded as the first influential protest song, Strange Fruit is not an easy listen. It compares the lifeless bodies of the victims to strange fruit hanging from the trees and references black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, bulging eyes and twisted mouths, and the sudden stench of burning flesh. Danny, this is Brain Blaze, not the casual criminalist. Why do we have to get so dark? And I know history's important, but dude. And I thought Puff the Magic Dragon was a bit much. When jazz singer Billie Holiday first began performing her electrifying version in clubs, she was met with a variety of reactions, including stunned silence, rapturous applause, racist heckling, and walkouts. Some club owners even attempted to ban her from performing the song in fear of pissing off the racist members of the audience until Billie added a clause to her contract in which she stipulated a compulsory rendition of Strange Fruit. But when it came to the studio recording and the single release, Billie's record label Columbia refused to get involved as they felt that Southerners were unlikely to propel it to the tops of the charts. No, sir, I don't like it. And her own producer, Milk Garber, refused to help Billy seek an alternative route to recording. Billy was forced to go it alone and turn to the much smaller label, Commodore Records, to get strange fruit in the can, and this turned out to be a smart move for everyone. Who had the guts to participate. The single went on to sell over a million copies, which is no small accomplishment considering that it was released during a time when most music fans were still buying God Bless America by Kate Smith. Yeah, I don't know the song at all, but now I want to go listen to it. Maybe I'll listen to that instead of The Final Countdown in just a day. It's kind of brought down my mood for listening to those songs, to be honest, unsurprisingly. But not everyone was happy. Let me guess who the racists. For many years, the protest song was banned by a long list of US radio stations, particularly down south, primarily it seems because racist people couldn't really dance to it. It's also believed by some that the track so angered Harry and Slinger, then head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, that he embarked upon a personal crusade to nail Billy Holiday for drug offenses. Bro, that is an abuse of power, and you did, uh, you need to be in prison for that shit. In fairness, he may have also targeted Billy because she had indeed become addicted to narcotics by the 1940s. Okay, then I take it back. Although, are we really going to go after one person? Can't we go after the people who are supplying her with drugs? That seems like a smarter move. Yeah, you can't, or, or can't we just make it all legal? Oh, 
yeah, no. You know what? No, yeah. Strange Fruit may have been pulled from far too many radio stations back in the day, but it's now regarded as one of the most powerful songs ever recorded. It's been added to the National Registry of the Library of Congress, and Time magazine declared it the song of the century in 1999. Time had certainly changed its tune, though. When Strange Fruit was first released, the very same magazine angrily denounced the song as nothing more than a piece of musical propaganda. <laughs> The propaganda of black people having rights! Christ, <laughs> don't mention the war. We are sailing, we are sailing. Oh, I know this one. Home again, cross the sea. I don't know if that second line is correct. I only know that we are sailing bit. Because uh, when I was a kid, I, I used to go sailing and we'd sing it, but we only knew that one line. <laughs> That's all we knew. We're just saying we are sailing over and over again. <laughs> we are such idiots. It's hard to immediately spot anything offensive in Rod Stewart's biggest ever hit from 1975, Sailing. It appears to be all about sailing. The video even shows Rod sailing in a boat <laughs> to drive the point home. Sir Rod didn't write it himself, but he reckons it's about the feeling of homesickness and wanting to sail back to native soil. Poor old Rod was missing the UK after moving permanently to America. He could have moved back to the UK at any time, but what? But that would have involved him paying taxes again. <laughs> Ah, the song we are sailing but not to the uk that song may have topped the uk charts on first release but the reason for its radio ban seven years later was purely because it made reference to the sea and during the falkland conflict of 1982 in which the uk went to war over a chunk of rock populated by penguins about 8,000 miles away most british broadcasters banned any songs which contained nautical references and this was felt to be inappropriate what, the British public can't handle the thought of boats going to war? Did we... It, what what happens? <laughs> we have a nation. Like, there was the Second World War, there was the First World War. We know that we can deal with this stuff. We're very hardy. This was particularly bad news for New Zealand band Splits End, Split Ends, who... His new single, Six Months in a Leaky Boat, partly about band leader Tim Vinn's nervous breakdown, was a big hit elsewhere, but tanked in the UK charts because of the radio silence. If all this sounds a bit hypersensitive, the situation only became more ridiculous a decade later during the Gulf War when the BBC took it upon itself to compile a list of 67 songs from history that were now deemed inappropriate for radio as they could be construed as referencing a military conflict. You can arguably see the logic behind some of those choices. The Gulf War was perhaps not the best time to be Bopping along to I'm Gonna Get Me a Gun by Cat Stevens or Living on the Front Line by Eddie Grant. Oh my god, Danny, the number of songs that I don't know from this video is extraordinary. And the number of songs that I know, like just We Are Sailing, and that's all, is also. I mean, I do, I have heard of like Cat Stevens. I haven't heard of Eddie Grant. I have heard of Rod. Stewart. But there were other songs that clearly didn't deserve a place on that list of shame. These included Atomic by Blondie, a song about sexual explosion. Okay. The End of the World by Skeeter Davis, about the distressing end of a relationship. Waterloo by Abba, about a woman who surrenders to a man but dares to compare the situation with a 180-year-old battle. What the f**k's going on? I don't know any of these songs. When the Going Gets Tough, the Tough Gets Going by Billy Ocean. Oh, I, I feel like I do know that one. No f**king idea what it's meant to be about, but I'd bet my last fruit pastel that it's not about blowing people up in the desert. What's going on? The strangest song of all to appear on the band list is In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins. Now that I do know. <laughs> Legend. This is meant to be about negative feelings in the air following poor Phil's divorce, but the BBC banned it in case anyone mistakenly thought it might be about scud missiles. <laughs> Why are you? How can you be so oversensitive to shit like this? It's actually mental. It does seem a little odd that the BBC felt their viewers could cope with wall to wall news coverage of an actual grisly war in which people were getting killed, but felt that their radio listeners couldn't cope with a jolly song that could be construed in the wrong way. And it seems even more baffling that whilst the list included Everybody Wants to Rule the World by Tears for Fears and Give Peace a Chance by the Plastic Ono Band, other songs deemed to be perfectly acceptable for radio broadcast included The Cure's 1978 debut single, Killing an Arab. Holy shit, the cure. <laughs> I don't know that one. <laughs> 
I saw mummy kissing Santa Claus. Although I'm very vaguely familiar with this sickly sweet American Christmas ditty from 1952, I always felt that the wailing lead vocalist was probably performed by a toothless old woman. In fact, it was performed by freckle-faced 13-year-old Jimmy Boyd, and, and this makes a lot more sense in the context of the song in which a young boy sneaks downstairs on the night of Christmas Eve and witnesses his own mother snogging Father Christmas. On first listen to the records, the lyrics do sound faintly troubling as the young narrator witnesses the saucy late-night scene in the living room and cheerfully ponders, Oh, what a laugh it would have been if Daddy had only seen Mummy kissing Santa Claus last night. Um, I don't know the song. I mean, I do. It's like vaguely in my mind. I don't know how it goes. So I'm not going to sing that verse. And that also spares you, dear listener. I mean, what in the name of Santa's beard is going on here? Doesn't Mummy love Daddy anymore? Is the marriage so irretrievably broken down that she's resorted to copping off with fictional characters? And what does Rudolph make of all of this? the important questions, Danny. Of course, there's a joke lurking in the lyrics if you take the time to think about it. It would never have crossed the narrator's mind that the man hiding inside the Santa costume is probably just his own father preparing the gifts for Christmas morning. Other versions of the song make this a lot clearer as they include a verse sung from the father's perspective. But this angle is never explicitly revealed in the most famous version sung by Jimmy Boyd, and the joke was lost on the Catholic Archdiocese of Boston who insisted on a blanket radio ban as they felt that this depiction of extramarital was associating salacious sinful sex with the celebrations of the sacred spawning of a savior. What the f*** are you doing? You must have such a small brain to not realize what is ex what's going on perfectly here. How small can your brain possibly be, Archdiocese? Really small. You have a tiny brain, Archdiocese. These guys must have wielded some power at the time as they got their wish. The song was banned from the airwaves in Boston and several other U.S. cities. It was left to 13-year-old Jimmy Boyd to sort out the misunderstanding that a record company, Columbia, dispatched Jimmy to the church-to-church -church leaders in Boston, where he was granted a private audience. That's a little worrying, as the Catholic Archdiocese of Boston was later exposed as not exactly the safest environment for a teenage boy. Oh, God. <laughs> I thought Danny was going to make a joke being like... Don't, le le less of a parents, don't send your teenage boys to see a Catholic priest alone in a private room. Just don't do it. Like, as a, a distasteful joke. But it turns out that's exactly what shouldn't have happened because, um, bec because we, we know the answer. However, Jimmy managed to convince the church leaders to lift the ban after he explained that the song was a perfectly innocent tale of daddy kissing mummy. They should have sent this kid to the Pope to persuade him that it's not inherently evil to use contraception. For f**k's sake, Catholic Church, get your shit together. I'm still not entirely convinced, though. If the kids had already been sent to bed, what was the point of the father dressing up as Santa? I'm also a little bit concerned that, if understood correctly, the song lets the cat out of the bag to the children of America that Santa doesn't exist. Yeah, that's a bigger problem. I got in trouble for that because I told my sister Santa wasn't real. Parents <laughs> <laughs> like, you could let the dream live on for a little bit longer. I'm a dick, though. I've always been a dick. I'm not sure what was on the flip side of the record, but I suspect it might have been Jimmy Boyne's haunting rendition of Christmas is cancelled because Santa died of rabies. <laughs> Fuck, Danny. Shit. Rabies is terrifying. That's the end. I'll see you next time. My uh, absolute lack of knowledge regarding anything PC. And by PC, I mean pop culture. <laughs>